The Holy Gospel according to the 20th chapter of Matthew. Jesus said to the disciples, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and again about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around him. And he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired around five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I was doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. You know when you're a kid and maybe something happens that you don't quite agree with or a sibling takes something or gets something that you think should be yours or your parents make a decision about something. There's a certain phrase that comes to mind in that situation a phrase that has been heard, I'm sure, through the millennia of childhood. The phrase is, that's not fair. Okay, maybe even you adults out there say that too sometimes, right? Right. And then, after you or one of your siblings would say, that's not fair, what would your mom or dad or grandma or grandpa say, there's a standard response after that, right? That's not fair. Then you hear, well, life's not fair, right? It wasn't just my mom, was it? I think it's one of those universal parenting phrases, just like that cry against unfairness is a universal kid complaint. I don't even know how many times I said, that's not fair, and then heard, well, life isn't fair when I was growing up, but it's a good amount. And I'm sure as my kids start to get a little bit older that I'll be saying right back at them too. But you know what? I hate to break it to you, but your mom was right. My mom was right. Life isn't fair. At least... Not in the way that we usually think about fairness. This is what Jesus is telling us in this parable from Matthew chapter 20. Our ideas of fairness and equality are pretty different from God's ideas of fairness and equality. And they are much, much, much harder to live out. So how is Jesus' definition of fairness different from ours? Well, first, let's think about how we usually define fairness in our world. What makes something or a situation or an outcome fair? The first thing we might think of is equal distribution, right? Like my mom, even though she would say life's not fair, she always made an effort every year to make sure that each three of us kids got the same amount of presents. At Christmas under the tree. That made it fair. This is funny because my husband and I 
often get into arguments about what it means to be fair when we split our household duties and chores. Because of my mom and me growing up, I'm very conscious of things needing to be very fair or equal, right? That's what I mean when I say fair in this context. And I will voice my concern when it's not. But my husband did not have this same kind of uh, stress on equality uh, growing up. And so for him, he doesn't have that same instinct that I do. He thinks it's fine that every once in a while we, we take turns shouldering different shares of the responsibilities. So that's just how it works out in a marriage and in families. You know, the funny thing, we just had an argument that when you boil it down, this was really what it was about. Just today. It was about whose turn was it to wake up with the four-year-old when he came bursting into the room, as he does at 6.30 a.m. every day when his little uh, light-up alarm clock goes off. And we usually take turns getting up with him. And uh, we argued about whose turn was it. And I had said, well, I did it yesterday, so it's not fair for me to do it today. <laughs> Anyone else have these kind of arguments in the relationship about fairness? Another way we think about fairness is in terms of payments, right? or wages, or work, like in the parable. We think that we do certain work, or a certain amount of work, and we respect, expect to receive a certain amount of payment or reward. We get this for that. And we don't really like exception to these rules, right? We want to know that everyone else has worked just as hard and as long as we have to earn that paycheck, right? Can't have anyone freeloading while we work our keisters off, right? You might have noticed so far that our ideas about what make things fair are mostly transactional. You do this or get this, and I do this or get this. It's about expectations of value. Our hard work and the consequent pay we get from it tells us how much value we hold in our world. In some ways, even tells us who we are. I think that's why this country, in this country, we are so addicted to that idea of, you know, pulling up your bootstraps and uh, starting with a dollar in your pocket and becoming a millionaire. The harder you work, the more you suffer, the more you earn, the more our lives have value at least in our world. So what does Jesus have to say about all this? His parable sure makes us rethink our definition of fairness. In this story, the workers are not paid based on the number of hours they work. They each receive the same pay, a full day's wages, even those who started late in the evening. And of course, those workers who started early in the day start up that familiar old refrain, that's not fair. They think that they should be paid more than the guys who came later. And according to the norms of our economy and theirs, they should, right? They worked longer, they should get more. But you know what? This isn't a story about our economy. This is a story about God's economy. God's economy doesn't run on money earned and hours worked. God's economy runs on grace, pure and simple. It's not about earning something or who gets what or how much or comparing that to someone else. God's grace is free, abundant, and for everyone, no matter what. And in God's world, that, God's economy, that is where we find our true value. But then I wonder, why is that grace so darn hard for us to accept? And why is it even harder for us to live by? Take Jonah, for example. This is a guy 
who had a hard time accepting grace. Now, don't get me wrong, he was fine accepting it for himself, right? In the part of his book we read today, he welcomes the tree or the bush that God grows for him and the shade it provides, even though he's in the middle of this epic temper tantrum. But he does not want that grace to be there for others, too. He especially does not want that grace to be there for those terrible Ninevites. And how often do we find ourselves thinking something similar? We are usually more than happy to accept gifts or bonus or favor or something just a little extra when it is for ourselves or for our community. But so many of us just hate to see something good happen to those people, those ones who haven't earned it, haven't worked hard enough for it, or don't deserve it, in our opinion. But the thing is, the really hard thing is, the gift that is God's grace doesn't depend at all on our earning or working or deserving. So why do we put up so many limits on what we give each other in this life when God doesn't do that to us? In this story, Jesus is calling us, his disciples, to be generous stewards of the resources we've been given. He's asking us to operate our lives on God's economy of grace instead of the economy of wages and earning. And he doesn't ask this just theoretically of something you believe. He's asking us to do this in real ways that change our lives and the lives of others. This is how we can create a world where we all have enough. Enough to eat, enough to survive, and even enough to thrive where we all have fulfilling, interesting work, opportunities for lifelong education, abundant health and wellness. We can create a world that has enough space for everyone to contribute from their talents and skills, not only surviving, but thriving. We just keep getting in our own way when we don't want to spread that grace of God around and share what we've been given. So I ask you, what is something in your life that you can shift to the new operation system, system under an economy of grace? Perhaps a relationship. Perhaps a donation or an organization that you're involved with. Perhaps it's with, if you're a business owner, how you treat employees or anyone who works for you. Because we could all just, if we could all just do that, operate from the economy of grace, with God's help, we could seriously change this world for the better. Can I get an amen? Thanks be to God.